My lungs burn with each gasping breath. Sweat trails down my neck, mingling with the coarse dust that cakes my skin. Light glares through the grimy viewport, hazy and toxic. Every siren screams the wrong message. This world, it can't be real. They all lied. I remember staring up at the hollow screens plastered across the cradle's ceiling as a kid. Lush forests, pristine oceans, Earth 2.0, our salvation. Now I see only warped yellow sky. That same screen above shows dwindling oxygen levels, the ship's lifeblood choked and starving. We're the last of humanity, marooned on a coffin built from our own desperation. My stomach lurches. It's not just the drop from orbit that does it. The thought of walking out there, masked or not, sends nausea clawing up my throat. The cradle wasn't a journey. It was a prison sentence stretched across generations. They told us this day would be a birth, a homecoming. The ship shudders as the landing braces lock, grinding into poisoned dirt. Someone sobs behind me, hope curdled into despair. My hands clench and unclench. No time for that. If I learned anything on the cradle, it's ruthlessness. Survival isn't just about enduring, it's about fighting for any scrap you can seize. They lied about this paradise. The question now, will they lie about how long we have to find another? A clang echoes through the ship, chilling the air more than the failing climate control. Finality has a sound, I realize, and it's the groan of metal settling against alien soil. I'm part of the first team out. Every eye in the cavernous launch bay looks to Captain Rook. Stern, stoic, weathered from a lifetime serving a purpose now hanging by a thread. He nods, and something inside me twists. His face is our compass, and there's none of the grim heroism I imagined. Just exhaustion, and something even worse. A desperate gleam like a starving man eyeing his last crumb. The outer hatch seals crack open with a mechanical hiss. For a moment, all we hear is the whine of our battered filtration system struggling against the noxious atmosphere. Even with the masks, there's a chemical edge to the recycled air that prickles at my exposed skin. Rook is out first, boots hitting the ground with a hollow thud. I follow, the team lining up behind me. Suits crunch on unfamiliar earth. Hard, brittle, cracked like it's been sucked dry. Dust plumes with each step, choking and yellow, blurring my vision. The sun glares through the haze, a weak, jaundiced thing. Com chatter crackles to life in my ear, reports flooding in. No immediate deadly threats, but the sensor readings paint a bleak picture. If we want water, it's locked deep beneath this dead crust. The air, well, I already taste it, metallic and acidic on my tongue. My insides clench. How long can human bodies bear this? Suddenly, Rook snaps his arm up, fist closed. We freeze in silent unison. There, just at the edge of visibility, something moves. Not a graceful sweep of branches or the startled flight of a bird. It's hunched, scuttling, darting between stunted, withered shrubs that defy this dying world. And in the comms link, I hear that same sharp intake of breath from a dozen crewmates. They lied about being the vanguard. It seems even dead planets can bear life. Even if it's only the kind that thrives where hope shrivels up and dies. Hold positions! Rook barks into the comm, voice rough, not fear, calculation. It's one thing to find dead dirt, another to share it. No one moves a muscle. Whatever that creature is, it hasn't spotted us yet. Sensors, I need visuals. Patch them through. Rook stares off into the yellow haze, his jaw working. We all do. Every instinct screams to run, to blast this wretched rock back into orbit. But something keeps us frozen in place. This might be death or data. And on a dying ship, knowledge buys time. Moments crawl by. Our forced stillness mirrors the desolate landscape, save for the laboured wheeze of our filtration suits. Then, in my headset, a voice crackles, Captain, I've got something. I practically feel the tension break over the comm line. 
my vision tunnels down to the point where the creature vanished. With agonizing slowness, the haze in my visor shifts. The image is grainy, infrared, but clear enough to make my stomach drop. The creature isn't an animal, not as we know it. Limbs too long, thin, ending in jagged points. Hunched form, but it moves as if testing the world around it, not stalking prey. And a head, large, smooth, reflective eyes, flashing beneath a bony ridge. Holy! Someone breathes, but Rook cuts them off with a sharp gesture. The thing hasn't turned towards us. Even masked, I can smell the fear hanging thick in the air. Our sterile bubble just burst. But Rook, it's different with him. He tilts his head slightly, studying. Get me samples, he orders, his voice tight. Air, soil, anything it comes near. If we're going to die here, we won't do it blind. My own fear warps into grim respect. The captain wasn't lying when he said the cradle taught ruthlessness. Turns out, even a poisoned paradise comes with its own desperate kind of opportunity. Two members of the team break off, Michaels and Lee. Their bulky suits seem even more cumbersome now, loaded with gear. They move carefully, a strange ballet in the dusty gloom. Their footsteps barely disturb the ground, but that creature could turn in a heartbeat. Every breath I take tastes of stale adrenaline. Michaels kneels at the base of a withered shrub. The creature had paused there, the sensors registering a spike in something, some emission we can't decipher. Lee hangs back, scanning the perimeter. Their movements are painfully slow, calibrated while my blood hammers in my ears. They seem so vulnerable, exposed and frail against the vast alien wasteland. Rook's voice rasps in my ear. Observation only. Remember, we need time to figure this thing out. Right, because figuring it out might save us. I force myself to study the creature, fighting the nauseous churn in my gut. It moves again, not towards the two collecting samples, but further off, picking through the cracked earth. We were braced for an attack, teeth or claws, or something primal. But this, this feels deliberate. There's intelligence in those obsidian eyes. But how much and of what kind? With every twitch of its spindly form, a question gnaws at me. Did this planet kill off whatever lived here before, or did life evolve to master the very poison in the air? Suddenly it freezes, head snaps upward, then swivels directly towards Michaels and Lee. Fall back! Rook roars, and both figures break into a clumsy run, laden with supplies, the dust-covered earth erupting with each clumsy stride. But the creature isn't charging. It tilts its head as they retreat as if puzzled by their panic. By the time the outer hatch groans shut, sealing Michaels and Lee safely back inside, Rook still hasn't taken his eyes off the spot where the aliens stood. The sterile ship air suddenly feels like suffocation. Maybe home was the lie, maybe we were born amongst stars only to die on this desolate grave. But in Rook's grim, focused stare, I see a hint of something like defiance. The cradle bred fighters, after all. Back inside the cradle, the sterile air prickles my skin with renewed intensity. It's the illusion of safety, a thin sheen I fear we've just shattered. My team peels off their contaminated outer suits, and though we follow decontamination protocol to the letter, the dread lingers just beneath the surface. I watch the medics swarm over Michaels and Lee, sensors beeping, swabs drawn. Even across the room I can make out the tremor in Michael's hands. This was more than just a recon mission. It was the first time in generations any human stepped foot outside the ship. Now that memory is imprinted with alien eyes and toxic skies. Captain Rook lingers with the medics, eyes narrowed, hands resting on his hips. It's not just medical interest. He's gauging our fear. It hangs heavy in the sterile air, unspoken yet inescapable. The first tremor, which might shatter everything, discipline, order, the brittle threads of hope. My mind races, and not just from the adrenaline fading. 
One creature isn't cause for abandoning ship. But something tells me Rook sensed what I did. That intelligence in the black, reflective eyes. This barren husk of a world seems engineered for hardship, and if life evolved alongside such relentless adversity, well, it certainly won't be easy prey. Labs. Analysis. ASAP. Rook says, voice echoing in the tense silence. What the hell are we dealing with? He doesn't wait for an answer, striding out of the bay, leaving the echo of those words ringing in my head. That question isn't curiosity. It's the first step in formulating a survival plan. I move past the med bay, heading towards engineering. No use dwelling on what-ifs. If that thing poses a threat, we need countermeasures, defences. My legs have already figured out the plan. Not rest, but focus. The ship taught us that every problem we solved brought us one day closer to a world where problems could be left behind. Now I can't shake the sinking feeling. We still may not make it through the night, but even a fighting chance beats that idyllic lie they peddled aboard the cradle. Because as we hurtle towards an uncertain future, one thing becomes clear. This isn't a paradise lost, it's a battlefield newly found. The clang of tools on metal reverberates through the bowels of engineering. It's an oddly comforting sound. The closest thing to a heartbeat the dying cradle possesses. The air feels thick, recycled and recycled again, and the fluorescent lights cast harsh shadows over the exposed machinery and schematics that cover the walls. Chief Engineer Torres throws me a curt nod when I arrive. A no-nonsense woman, built as solid as the machines she maintains. She doesn't ask why I'm here or how the mission went. Everyone felt the ship groan when it landed, heard the silence when the outer hatch closed. News on the cradle spreads like fire in a tinderbox. What can we repurpose? I ask, wasting no time. Sentiment gets you killed, replaced. On the ship, efficiency has always been salvation. I scan the workstations surrounding us, taking rapid inventory. Energy distribution relays, salvaged comms equipment, Raw materials scavenged from a dozen systems past their prime. Every tool has a use, but they were never designed for this type of warfare. Torres follows my gaze, expression grim. It's the unknowns, isn't it? Atmosphere. That creature. Whatever hitched a ride back. She shakes her head. Standard defense protocols won't cut it if we don't even know what it is we're fighting. My mind flashes back to the creature. Elongated limbs, smooth carapace, those inscrutable eyes. Was it a hunter or a scavenger like us? Did it even fear weapons? Torres sighs, the sound harsh amid the constant hum of failing ventilation. The cradle wasn't meant for this. Not as an ark, not as a weapon. But even amidst a failing ship surrounded by inadequate tools, desperation breeds a dangerous kind of resolve. Not yet, I say, determination seeping into my voice, but it will be. Torres eyes me for a long moment, appraising. Perhaps she senses the same thing that drives Captain Rook, that desperate will to turn back the clock on extinction. Then, a ghost of a smile tugs at her lips. Always were the optimistic sort, huh? All right, let's start thinking like scavengers again. Maybe there's something this old girl can give us after all. We turn back to the schematics plastered on the walls, blueprints transformed into a battle plan. We're explorers trapped in the guise of warriors, but every step on this dead rock proves, in the bleakest irony, that we are our ancestors' legacy. If any hope exists, we'll have to forge it here, one brutal solution at a time. The cradle groans throughout the night, it's not just the strain on failing generators, the filtration units choked with alien dust, or even the damage sustained during the turbulent descent. It's the unspoken anxiety humming through every bulkhead, every air duct, the collective weight of knowing that our metal womb is now surrounded by a world poised to destroy us. In the sterile glow of our cramped quarters, sleep's impossible. Instead, I trace my fingers over the salvaged datapad Torres dug out. It's an archaic thing, 
almost an antique, filled with decades-old mission logs the cradle carried from Earth. Our ancestors' words, their first contact jitters, ecological survey jargon, hopes for a lush second chance, our ghosts whispering from the screen. They seem naive now, even arrogant. There's nothing naive about our situation. A sharp buzz slices through my thoughts. One glance at the comm system on the wall, and I'm already on my feet. It's Rook, the only one awake at this ungodly hour. Or perhaps the only one who can't afford rest. His rough voice echoes in the room. Report to the observation deck and bring Torres. My boots pound against the deck plating as I hurry. Every turn in the labyrinthine ship could be the last. That thought used to be theoretical. Now it's the pulse of blood in my veins. By the time I reach the deck, Torres is already waiting, her expression mirroring my own. Grimly determined, with a touch of trepidation I won't admit to. Rook stands silhouetted against the main viewport, overlooking the wasteland he led us into. In the dim light, I can pick out his tense posture, fingers curled around the cold metal railing. It hits me then. It's not just about survival. If anyone could have piloted the remnants of humanity here to our death sentence, it would have been Rook to fail. It would be more than the end of us. It would be the snuffing out of humanity's final candle. Lab results were... His voice trails off and there's a rustle of paper he's turning over. So mundane, I almost want to laugh at the absurdity. We crossed galaxies and his fate hinges on some scribbled lab notes. Finally, he continues. Not good. Air samples are worse than sensors projected and... His pause stretches impossibly. Michaels and Lee, he rasps, and my pulse quickens. Something changed when they went outside. My first question hits the room like a physical blow. How? Exposure protocols had been ingrained in us since birth. Every inch of the ship was scoured between shifts with a ruthlessness that beat back even the tiniest microbe. Yet here we were, facing a foe more dangerous than vacuum or cold. An enemy we might have breathed into our sanctuary. Torres inhales sharply, her voice mirroring my rising dread. Cellular abnormalities in both subjects. Something's happening replicating. The process was too slow for standard scans during decon. Rook slams a fist down on the railing, the metallic clang echoing. He doesn't need to utter the words hanging in the air. Contagion. Not a virus or bacteria we know, but an alien poison now loose inside the cradle. One exposure was a risk. Now, two carriers were ticking time bombs in a closed ecosystem. My heart thuds against my ribs with a panicked staccato. I knew this planet would try to kill us. The atmosphere, the creatures. But this? An insidious attack from within. The thought turns my stomach acidic. Rook turns to face us, his face shadowed, yet in his eyes burns that desperate fire I had recognized earlier. Options, he demands, voice clipped. Torres hesitates. A lifetime of engineering logic warring with the monstrous unknown now clawing at the ship's lifeblood. Quarantine them for observation. See if whatever this is plays out or if their bodies adapt. Her voice falters as the bleak implications dawn on us all. In the confined viewport, the planet looks even more menacing. It doesn't need to attack us overtly. Just wait till we weaken, fighting an invisible war inside a tomb we had once called home. The silence becomes oppressive. I know what needs to be said, the solution bred and honed out of cradle life's harsh realities. Yet, hesitation still grips my tongue. This wasn't breaking down faulty engines or splicing wires together. Finally, my own voice rings out, echoing the harsh judgment honed by generations spent in the steel belly of the ship. There isn't time. One wrong breath, one infected surface. This invisible assault could unravel us faster than any hostile alien attack. Rook nods, the motion small yet final. It's not cruelty, not vengeance. It's cold reality. The law that superseded all others on board the cradle. Protect the collective. Sometimes at the cost of the few. 
The decision makes me sick, yet numb at the same time. This was just the start. One hard call among an infinity that now lay ahead. There's something uniquely brutal about a decision made when there's nothing to do but await its consequences. Rook doesn't waste another syllable. We all understand the order embedded in that wordless nod. No grand speeches, no tearful goodbyes. The cradle bred practicality, and there was nothing practical about prolonged suffering jeopardizing the entire ship. I watch his retreating back, wondering if that stoicism makes him a stronger leader, or if the role has whittled something essential away from him piece by piece. Torres and I make our way back through the dimly lit, eerily silent halls. It's the hour before shift change, but the usual background hum of life feels wrong somehow, too loud against the unspoken fear now echoing within the metal skin of our dying home. We reach the medbay, where the harsh fluorescent lights only emphasize the sterility of it all. No one has to say a word about what comes next. Michael and Lee lie in sealed cubicles, their breathing harsh behind clear panels. They're still asleep, mercifully oblivious to the death sentence sealed the moment we stepped foot on this damned planet. My throat tightens. A pang of... not guilt exactly, but the hollowness that comes when you understand you're a cog in a merciless machine. Every generation aboard the cradle faced choices like these. Survival whittling down compassion one decision at a time. We were forged in that crucible, but it also twisted something within us. Torres gives a curt nod and a pair of medics appear. They're masked, expressions obscured by sterile plastic. One carries a hypospray, the other a sealed disposal chamber. No dramatics, just practiced efficiency. There's an unspoken respect in that, giving them this small dignity before turning them into biohazardous waste. There will be no proper burials, no spacewalk into the black, returning them to the stars that brought us here. No headstones. They will be recycled, their atoms perhaps forming part of the new defences against an uncaring world. This too is part of the Cradle's legacy. We waste nothing, not even death. A single injection releases a sedative, then another to gently halt their hearts. I turn away, not from any sense of squeamishness, but because it suddenly feels wrong to watch as their faces slacken and bodies surrender. To witness how easily another's life blinks out with an efficiency built from generations of desperation. We will win, or this rock will be our unmarked grave. The cost, well, I refuse to tally it yet. Not while the fight has just begun. Word spreads silently. There's no point in hiding such deaths aboard the cradle. Rumour twists itself through the cramped quarters, morphing into grotesque speculation. What's happening to their bodies? Is the infection worse than we suspect? Is anyone safe? Whispers gnaw at morale, and I worry it might inflict more damage than the poison we carried back with us. Rook calls another assembly. As grim-faced crew members cram into the main mess hall, it's like we've regressed. Those years traversing the black reduced to this. Huddled survivors bracing for the next strike. His announcement is brief, factual, laced with a steely edge that brooks no questions. The situation, the infected crew, their termination. A stark chronicle of brutal necessity. Yet, a shift begins. Fear warps, becomes anger, defiance. Whispers find a target. That alien world outside. Later on the observation deck, Torres finds me looking out at the yellow haze swallowing the horizon. My anger has cooled, replaced by a numb resolve. Rook was right. Something had to be done to quell the growing panic. And the planet serves as a grim motivation. That thing out there, she nods toward the viewport the way it was watching. For the first time, there's a tremor in her voice, a crack in that carefully constructed pragmatism. I realize we're both thinking the same thing. No random scavenger could have evolved those eyes, that intelligence. That thing knew we were there, assessed us. Not like prey, but competitors. Perhaps it even understood we were on borrowed time. 
A world this harsh, I finish aloud. Life here isn't just tough, it's calculating. There's a war outside, Torres, one we may have walked into blindly. Her silence holds its own grim affirmation. This species doesn't just survive, it dominates. They have made a weapon of this dying planet and honed themselves against its dangers. That realization brings a twisted kind of clarity, galvanizing. It's a battlefield now, and we're the underdogs. The cradle has always prized ingenuity born of shortages, but this takes it to another level. Survival isn't a matter of waiting for rescue or trying to make this place bloom. To find any future here, we may have to become more like our foe, turning not to mercy, but relentless adaptability. This world might try to break us, but it hasn't won just yet. Days blur into a frantic cycle, analyze, fabricate, fail, repeat. It's a battle fought through gritted teeth and on caffeine-fueled adrenaline. Our existence narrows to the engineering bay and the labs, their walls papered with calculations, half-baked theories and fading hope. The cradle groans in protest as we scavenge, repurpose and push it to its very limits. Every inch of the planet we uncover feels like a blueprint for failure. Nothing we were led to believe matches the desolate reality. It's a masterclass in brutal efficiency. Toxins woven into the air, creatures hardened against the elements, a lethal symbiosis between death and those that endure. Our sterile suits and neat calculations seem ridiculous in the face of such relentless adaptation. It's Rook, eyes bloodshot yet fiercely determined, who forces perspective. This isn't about thriving, he says, voice strained from endless meetings and sleepless nights. It's about holding ground long enough to change the rules. And so we descend into a strange mimicry. Our tools borrowed from a dying ship, our tactics shaped by an ecosystem evolved for annihilation. Torres adapts mining lasers meant for asteroids into crude but effective area denial weapons. It lacks elegance, but we see results. Those scuttling things seemingly drawn to the warmth and radiation the cradle leaks, now retreat singed when they breach our improvised perimeter. My team designs exoskeleton frames with repurposed hydraulics, the clumsy suits not meant for battle, but for brief forays out of the ship to collect more samples or adjust our lethal perimeter. Every success earns us time, every breath another chance at unraveling this planet's lethal secrets. One grim morning, under the sickly yellow sun, I watch a new team in those cobbled-together suits venture out, the medic from decontamination died days ago, the infection too swift. It feels like every step forward costs a life, yet I sense a shift. We're still dying, but not blindly. This might not be the paradise we sought, but neither is it an instant tomb. It's a monstrous puzzle, and we finally have the pieces to begin solving it. We survive not with a miraculous breakthrough, but by grit and a thousand tiny victories. Lab techs collapse and get dragged back to their bunks by grim-faced replacements. Our energy grid falters, and every blackout sends echoes of despair through the cradle. Still, Torres manages to squeeze more efficiency out of our failing engines. When my suit prototypes fall apart, too hastily constructed, we salvage parts, rebuild and try again. Every step forward is a slap in the face of this hostile world. Rook becomes a gaunt spectre, haunted more by lives lost than sleep deprivation. Every meeting ends with the same unspoken burden. How long till it's not enough? No solution lies in wait aboard the dying cradle. This world needs to become our unwilling shipyard, our grim arsenal. And the key to that might not rely on science, but on desperation, mimicking intelligence. I spend hours observing the creature, now contained within our most heavily sealed labs. It paces its glass prison, the limbs tapping with a maddening rhythm. We've pumped the chamber full of the planet's air, trying to find its breaking point, the key to destroying its kind. So far, it simply endures, 
eyes flashing with the same unnerving sentience, watching us back. It knows we're doing this, I find myself muttering. Torres is slumped beside me, eyes hollow. Maybe it knows we have to, she replies, voice rough and weary. Maybe it's waiting. That word hangs heavily, and suddenly, amidst the exhaustion and the fear, a perverse question takes root. Was it just us who crash-landed a generation's ship of lies onto this rock, or were we lured? Could this world and its harsh evolved survivor sense our weakness even across the stars? The creature stops pacing, its head cocking ever so slightly as it stares back at us through the glass. I stand abruptly, fear twisted with newfound determination. There's only one question now. Can we outsmart an enemy that thrives on adversity? Perhaps even feeds on it? Because the battle won't be over with crude weapons and scavenged tech. It might be waged on something the humans of Earth forgot. Something the cradle dulled in us over generations of sterile security. Sheer, defiant cunning. It's a slim hope, yet the only one we have left worth fighting for. Hope, it turns out, isn't born from comfort. It festers in shadows, fed by desperation and tempered in failure. I realize this as I gather a small team, those with a particular gleam in their eyes, not optimism but an acceptance of how grim the odds truly are. The cradle may have dulled our teeth, but the will to bite was still inside us somewhere. First, we lure in more of the creatures. Those laser perimeter defenses have a new function. Now they only maim allowing my team to snag one of the spindly things with repurposed cargo slings. It screeches and thrashes, toxic dust billowing. It's dangerous, it's ugly, and it's our best weapon yet. The ship has to become another monster, I explain, meeting a mixture of grim acceptance and fear in my team's eyes. That's what survives out there. This isn't the sterile science from textbooks or the calculated risk we trained for. It requires stepping outside of our comfort zone and into the grotesque. Days become a haze of agonizing experimentation. We take shifts in the sealed lab, surrounded by screens flashing the tortured creature's vitals. I can barely stomach watching as we force-feed its samples we gathered on forays beyond the cradle, monitoring its violent reactions. Slowly, a terrifying picture emerges. Its biology is horrifically efficient, almost modular. It adapts, rerouting around toxins, evolving new countermeasures with shocking speed. We've only begun to scrape the surface of what lives beneath its chitinous exterior. Yet, those same grotesque experiments point us toward a twisted breakthrough. They highlight patterns, not strengths, but exploitable vulnerabilities. This creature evolved in isolation, in an environment with little change. But now, exposed to the cradle's alien microbes, the radiation it bleeds, we can accelerate its adaptation, weaponize it. Not as a poison, but a carefully tailored assault on its own system. It means infecting the captive with mutated viruses. A calculated gamble. Will we simply create a deadlier strain? It's an unnerving echo of what happened to Lee and Michaels, except now I willingly wield the same monstrous forces that threaten to erase us. This time I hope those same forces might just turn the tide. We work around the clock, knowing each hour ticks down not just the cradle's life support, but our chances of harnessing the virus before it consumes our monstrous guinea pig. When I find Rook awake for the hundredth night staring at the poisonous haze on the viewport, an unspoken agreement passes between us. It's time. This plan is as reckless as it is terrifying, but there's nothing left but forward momentum. Either we create something new in the face of death, or it comes for us regardless. The weapon isn't elegant. Torres cannibalizes parts of environmental control, rigging a dispersal mechanism capable of blasting a wide radius. I watch her worn hands fly with a precision born of despair, crafting this grotesque mirror of survival. We load it with the altered virus, now ticking like a warped second heartbeat within its casing. 
Our first target isn't a massive horde of creatures, but a small cluster we've been tracking for days. Torres directs the release with tense precision. The cradle shudders, coughing out this deadly new mist. We hold our breath, not in fear, but in nauseating anticipation. Minutes pass, agonizingly slow. And then movement. The spindly beings hesitate, twitch unnaturally. Our screens flare with erratic readings, and a wave of gruesome satisfaction mixed with horror washes over us. Within hours, the creatures turn not on us, but on each other. The brutal efficiency they possessed turns against them, our viral payload triggering a horrifying battle for survival within their own ranks. I witness them rip into one another, a frenzy of snapping limbs and screeches that carry even through the cradle's hull. What the poison cannot kill, their monstrous instinct finishes. It's not clean or triumphant. Watching it, there's an undeniable dread. We've become something darker, a creature forged in the dying cradle that can unleash this monstrous mimicry of the world outside. Yet, we see results. Creatures flee the perimeter where their comrades tore each other apart. This poisoned world has turned inward, giving us a foothold, however grim its purchase. Rook's voice crackles over the ship's comm system, a note of rough triumph cutting through the usual exhaustion. Perimeter clear. I say again, all units report the perimeter is clear. It's surreal, yet it pierces the fog of despair surrounding the cradle. We haven't won, but we've bought time, and by doing so, earned the grim chance to try for a future built not on dreams, but a ruthless will to endure. There's no grand cheer, only weary relief amidst ragged breaths. We don't dare think too far ahead. Every victory could be swallowed by a twist of fate, a mutation this harsh world concocts, or a mistake of our own making. But that evening, we eat hot rations for the first time in weeks. I find myself drawn again to the viewport. The yellow haze is thinner, pierced by shafts of weak sunlight. That monstrous ingenuity was our gift to this place. An unnatural blight spreading just as the creatures did. Yet, the landscape looks, if not less hostile, then less assured. In that small disruption, Hope finds a twisted purchase. There are still dangers lurking below. Perhaps our monstrous mimicry of this world might trigger further mutations. But we are no longer simply victims to be picked off. We've entered a gruesome stalemate, and stalemate means potential. For the first time, I wonder not about escape, but about adaptation. Maybe we won't find paradise here, nor reclaim the lie of home. But somewhere amidst the grit, beneath the poisoned sky, something might be forged. It won't be pretty, and I fear what it might twist us into. But even the cradle that nurtured humanity's hope was metal and machinery, a thing sculpted not by grace but by ruthless practicality. And the remnants of this generation are forged in that same unforgiving mould. I look from that dying view back towards the lab where the remnants of our bioweapons still glow with sickly light. Perhaps there are no heroes aboard this broken ship, nor a return to what we once imagined. There's just that cold determination that sparked aboard the cradle, that stubborn flame to endure. And now, tempered by this cruel planet, it might well evolve into the thing that saves us. Months turn into a gruelling cycle. We become grim architects of this poisoned landscape, each foray outside a careful act of war and calculated contamination. Yet, with every victory, with every patch of territory hesitantly carved out, we uncover not salvation, but opportunity born of hardship. This isn't simply survival. It's the start of a twisted colonization. Torres's haggard face cracks into a rare grin as she unveils the fruits of our monstrous adaptation. It's an ugly creation, part scavenged mining laser, part repurposed environmental filtering. Fed by the very radiation the cradle bleeds, it spits out a stream of concentrated toxic dust. No longer simply chasing off the creatures, we've begun shaping the poisoned terrain 
to our purposes. With every blast, we mimic the desolation this world crafted, bending it back to form crude but surprisingly effective barriers. We don't dare breathe this manufactured wasteland, of course. Even masked, every sortie leaves us wheezing, eyes burning. But we observe, and the creatures give these warped boundaries a begrudging birth. For now, we have claimed territory, bought space. Within that hard-won perimeter, hope sprouts with a grotesque vigor. It's in the quarantined biolab, bathed in sterile light, that I observe its twisted manifestation. Fungal splotches grow across salvaged cradle panelling. Not decay, but something else. They feed on the toxins in the air. Torres's sleep-deprived eyes shine with grim triumph. Purifiers, she rasps, running a gloved hand over the hardy growth. We've turned this poison into the seeds of our own atmosphere. I find a horrifying beauty in it. We won't just survive here. We might just make this hostile home bend to our will, one monstrous innovation at a time. And late at night, as the failing cradle creaks with defiant exhaustion, I gaze up from the fungal growth towards the poisoned sky above. This world won't give us paradise. What it yields is far more brutal, a chance to prove that we can become monstrous enough to seize it anyway. This may not be what we dreamt of amongst the stars, but it's all we have left, and that, I realize, is enough for a desperate kind of beginning. The cradle becomes something unrecognizable, an ungainly beast limping against its programmed obsolescence. It's no longer just a haven. It's our weapon, our forge, our dying heart given one final, monstrous purpose. This transformation gnaws at me. There's a dark irony in how all those generations trapped in sterile metal now embrace the toxic, evolving into some hybrid creature this planet might eventually deem worthy of survival. Our progress isn't linear. With every adaptation, new dangers emerge. The fungi that now cleanse the air also spread too eagerly, requiring fierce containment. Some nights I wake to distant shrieks echoing in the vents, reminders of the creatures still evolving and lurking. But with each dawn, with each coughing breath, there's a grim comfort in this. We haven't died yet. The struggle has carved us into something harder, sharper. On the observation deck, Rook watches the sunrise bleed a sickly yellow through the haze. In the harsh dawn, the lines on his face have deepened, etching a decade onto his features in just a handful of months. We speak little, not out of despair, but a shared, brutal understanding. Our success means nothing if we become monstrous reflections of the planet we fight. Each life lost to the mutations, every crude weapon scavenged. It carves into the tattered shreds of our humanity. How far do we go? His question feels more rhetorical than an invitation to debate. The answer terrifies me because of its stark simplicity. As far as we have to, I find myself saying, because beyond any ideal or morality carved into dusty textbooks, there's a single undeniable truth. The Cradle's progeny will either out-adapt this harsh world or perish amongst its poisoned expanse. There's no time for ethics. The line between victim and perpetrator has been hopelessly blurred. We simply do what must be done. He nods, a jerky, exhausted motion. Then he points toward a cluster of blips on a sensor array. More creatures encroaching. A never-ending siege. Then I guess it's a damn good thing, he croaks with a grim twist of a smile, that we are so adaptable. His words sink in, leaving me with a taste of ash and a strange echo of determination. Perhaps the true test of humanity isn't preserving some idyllic version of ourselves, but how deeply we're willing to change, to evolve, and even sacrifice pieces of who we were for the sake of who we desperately need to become. Years bleed into each other. Time warps under the ceaseless grind of existence. The cradle exists only in fragments now. Its core engines keep our Frankensteinian constructs running, fueled with salvaged scraps and repurposed tech. 
Its metal bones form the skeletons of new habitats, half hovels, half bunkers, each built further away from the poisoned belly that first brought us here. Life takes on a grotesque rhythm. Torres hunches over the fungal farms, eyes bloodshot, the growth her greatest triumph and constant threat. Every batch of purified air they produce pushes out our fragile foothold. Meanwhile, my team has become something between engineers and grim hunters. We maintain the perimeter, adapt our viral constructs as new mutations in the creatures emerge. Even their screeches echoing outside our border feel less terrifying, more a reminder of the unending war of evolution that we must stay one step ahead of. Rook, well, I barely recognize him. Once a symbol of authority, he's a gaunt warrior leader now, haunted yet unwavering. The children born on this harsh rock bear no resemblance to our ship-raised generation. They have no memory of false promises, of Earth 2.0. They watch the poisoned sunlight with wary eyes, inheritors of a conflict older than themselves. I teach them of our ancestors only as cautionary tales. Better they understand this crucible as their first and only true world. Then a change ripples through this harsh routine. On the sensors, a new wave gathers, larger than anything we've seen in years. They surge and retreat, the readings erratic, almost organized. When I report to Rook, his gaze turns hard as flint. In that moment, I realize why his shoulders haven't slumped, why his back is still straight, despite it all. The ship taught us one thing, even through lies. You fight on, no matter the odds. This world, it was never going to yield easily. But after everything, we understand the rules now. It's an arms race, an endless evolutionary chessboard, and either we make a bold move or get wiped off in one final brutal attack. It appears this dying planet has grown bored with the stalemate. I almost admire the challenge in it. A kind of brutal acceptance floods through me. The cradle made us, warped us, led us to this twisted genesis. Perhaps we were only ever destined to survive by turning into something alien ourselves, our humanity the first victim on the long path of adaptation. It's the kind of truth no hollow screens depicting lush forests could ever reveal. But for every shred of ourselves we leave behind, scattered across this poisoned field, we might leave a generation behind that won't just survive, but thrive in the bleak heart of it all. Maybe this, and not that sterile ship, is our true legacy. The cradle falls, yes, but that also marks the point where we must find the strength to stand.